Awesome, thanks so much. Um, so this, in the context of this presentation, my goal is relatively to provide a short overview, a brief overview of some of the geospatial methods that are potentially applicable towards understanding some of the questions that we've been uh, talking about in the context of this workshop in terms of understanding uh, neuroscientific processes or just processes of in interest in situ. And what I hope to accomplish in the context of this presentation is the relatively modest goal of illustrating some of the tools that we have at hand at the moment to understand how some of these processes of interest operate outside of the lab, outside of the clinic, in the context of everyday life. So building off of some of um, Mike's presentation and understanding how context enables us to answer questions that relate not only to between individual variation, such as, for instance, how it is that uh, Vietnamese Americans, say, in Los Angeles differ from Vietnamese in Hanoi, but also within person processes and variation, such as how it is that one person differs from context A to context B, from time point one to time point two, and if there is no difference or the, var the variation is low than what that means, which I personally find to be a little bit more uh, interesting. So what these methods get at is this, this general notion of putting people into place. Um, and this essentially means, uh, what this essentially gets at is this, is this observation that physical and mental health vulnerabilities as well as outcomes are not randomly distributed but often geographically clustered. So let's so let me provide uh, a few short examples. Uh, so one of the most commonly studied place effects has to do with living in an impoverished neighborhood. So the, in terms of the general literature, what we know is that residents in more economically impoverished areas, on average, have, have um, higher all-cause mortality than th do those in wealthier neighborhoods. And so, for instance, traveling from the wealthiest neighborhoods in London, say, to the most impoverished area, you see that male lifespan expectancy drops by more than 20 years. Um, so, and concomitantly, individuals in impoverished neighborhoods uh, are estimated to spend approximately 17 years of their life living with a disability of some kind. And so this, these gradients emphasize the need to understand how it is that the contexts in which we work, the contexts in which we play, the contexts in which we live, influence health outcomes. And so part of what putting people into place really means is how we begin to understand these different exposures that people have on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and what are the methods that, that allow us to look at these exposures with greater granularity? Um, so place effects. Um, really, I think there's, there's been increasing interest on place effects, but really, as a meta-analysis in 2012 would suggest, most of the studies that examine place effects really just focus on residential neighborhoods. But anyway, um, what it impacts, place can impact a range of outcomes um, that have been documented in literature, such as allostatic load, self-rated health, sleep quality, um, symptoms of depression, anxiety, somatic symptoms such as dizziness or nausea, as well as a range of other health outcomes. And, and also that place structure structures, net network opportunities, and thereby potentially risk-taking behavior. So as an example, um, among injection drug users, for instance, 94% of their romantic partners and 97% of their drug use partners reside within a five-mile radius of where they live. And so I think this really draws on some of the conversations we had on Tuesday with uh, Lawrence and Carol in terms of the company that we keep and how it is that place both, both enable and constrain uh, these, these interactions. Uh, who we associate with. Um, so in terms of what space or place really means, I think really it is a little bit of a black box that is similar to the way in which culture is a black box. And indeed, we could potentially um, think of place effects as encompassing three different types, uh, three different types, and some do, in terms of the compositional effects that have to do with the attributes of the individual that reside within that space. So for instance, the religious affiliation, the age, and, and what have you. And then there's the contextual effects that have to do with physical uh, as well as the social disorder of the particular space that we're looking at. So for instance, attributes like broken windows or the number of syringes or the number of uh, venues that are available for sex work or for alcohol consumption, consumption say. And then there's also the shared um, meanings and, and, and practices and attitudes within that particular space. And, and, th and so I think, at least for the sake of this presentation, perhaps we can briefly think of space and place as being this special ensemble of physical infrastructure, technology, information, resources, and social relations that is physically f grounded in a place on Earth. So that is, there are coordinates that one could look at. And encompasses processes that unfold between people, um, as well as between people and places, and between different places as well and the meanings that people attach to their location. So for instance, particular cities, for instance, uh, eliciting feelings of particular areas of a city, eliciting feelings of fear, feelings of unbelonging or alienation, and what that really means, residing in those particular locations uh, on physical and mental health. 
So I think when we're thinking about place effects, this gets us back at socio-ecological models, of which there are various kinds. Um, but for the sake of memory, for memory's sake, or for, uh, I don't know, emphasis, memory, uh, reinforcement, uh, I thought I would bring back uh, Carroll's bioecocultural bio model, which looks, uh, focuses specifically on the devel developmental niche and how it is that we begin to understand a child's developmental outcomes in the contexts of the developmental niche. So for instance, the child's own capacities and capabilities vis-a-vis -vis, um, caregiver psychology and also in terms of ca caregiving practices that are pervasive at the time. But this, of course, is nested within a larger cultural and, and, cultural, uh, and physical context in which a varying house conditions, a varying exposures to violence of varying exposures to infectious microbes that can influence a number of later health outcomes. So, and, and I think these, what these socio-ecocultural models, whichever one you look at, really aims to accomplish is really to extend beyond these proximal individual determinants of health towards, um, to situate them within particular structural, organizational community, as well as familial contexts, um, and to really understand that dynamic interplay between the individual and, and, and their environment. So I'll be speaking a little bit more about that in the context of experience sampling and how it is that you use experience sampling in the context of more geographically explicit um, approaches. Uh, but also, more, I, I just thought I would go over a different, a different socio-ecological model, Rhodes' socio-ecological model, that has a little to do more with what I do, which is, in this case, HIV. So on the one level, you know, you have the individual um, with uh, their individual attributes. So for instance, uh, for the sake of my research, say an 18-year-old uh, men who have sex with man, men who have sex with men, rural urban migrants in Hanoi, who's Vietnamese, male sex worker, and this individual might have very particular perception of their risk environment, of their space, of their relation to Hanoi. Um, for instance, a lake. Uh, King Guang Lake, which is this very po which is this very popular site for sex work, and during the night, the daytime, you have male sex workers, female sex workers, sorry, that that, are, that surround the lake. And if you were, for instance, an Asian female researcher anthropologist, say, that were to do a field audit of this site, then you could easily be mistaken as a as a female as a female sex worker. But during the nighttime, this changes completely. During the nighttime, say 10 p.m., for instance, this suddenly shifts to a site for male sex work for male sex sex workers, and so you have men, old men. They're cruising the scene in search of male sex workers. Um, and often also, you know, and so there's, the, the risk environment changes. And this person's relation um, to their perceived risk environments uh, will be different, for instance, than a 60-year-old female tourist from, from the US, even though both might be at the very same site. Because Tingguang Lake is actually, aside from a very popular place for sex work, it's also a very, sex, very popular place for tourism. Uh, not sexual tourism. Um, so, <laughs> Just to clarify, um, but anyway, so so but 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 so so there's the perceived risk environment, right? So these these are all functioning at the individual level, um, um, and the individual might feel, for instance, socially isolated, might perhaps a more concrete sense of physical, um, a physical danger, and indeed, you know. Among the sample that I work with, 30% or so have had a, a, a history of, um, of sexual abuse. So as individuals become hypervigilant, attention becomes biased towards social threats and also negative expectations independent of actual risk exposure within, say, Tingguang uh, Lake. And this the perceived sense of physical and social disorder have been shown in the literature to corrode, um, to increase hypervigilance as well as to, de, uh, to corrode perceptions of neighborhood quality, which can predict worse health outcomes, which can predict increased cardiometabolic risk and, incre and higher allostatic load. And as I've mentioned, uh, with the example of the 94% of sexual partners and injection drug users, 97% of drug partners residing within a five mile radius of each other, um, there's also a second level to this, which is, so there's the individual level, but then there's also this social network, the social networks that people are enmeshed in, which might promote different health taking, uh, risk taking behaviors, such as alcohol consumption, such as smoking, which can increase, for instance, um, Inflammation and in broader strokes, there, these are these are ways of thinking about nestedness, and I think also um, the applications of multi-level models towards understanding this nestedness of individuals within different uh, contexts. So which have implications for intervention. But um, these, these models, of course, are very fancy and they look beautiful. And of course, obviously, the more that you put in there, the more beautiful it becomes. But, but, but really, when you're measuring it, how do you, how do you simplify it? And how do, how, what do, I guess, geospatial data, what do GIS-related, um, GPS-related data sort of look like? And so, I mean, maps really simplify reality for analysis. And therein is the cartographic paradox. And to quote, it really, to present uh, this uh, beautiful and, and accurate map, 
map. What you need to do, a good map needs to tell white lies. So for instance, in that image is not visible. OK, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, in, in the. Um, in my left, uh, that image right there, um, you see that a house may be thought of, may be portrayed in many different ways. But here, in the context of this map, it is a red dot on uh, here, and and um, and this facilitates our ability to calculate distance. So distance from the home towards a clinic, distance from the home towards a school, or distance from home towards a food store, for instance. And a road and river, it, it might differentially divide. But here, in the context of this map, it really just constitutes a one line that that divides two places that form the boundary between two places. So I think what this really gets at is that, that you know, however complex the models, however complex we think about nestedness, geospatial data really boil down to th two things. One is the spatial data that, has to, that specifies the location where someone physically is on Earth, and the attribute data, which have to do with the features of that particular space. So for instance, um, the, you know, this building is located 45.5 degrees uh, north and, and 75.6 degrees west, for instance. And, but attributes of this, for instance, the width of the building, the, the building material, as well as the windows, the number of windows, say, um, constitutes attributes that are stored in a database table. And so the research question should, should drive decisions on levels of aggregation, scale, and type of data that you use. And this actually presents several dilemmas um, in terms of decision making in the context of research. Uh, and two of the, the issues that usually come up in the context of, uh, of GIS related work has to do with one is the modifiable aerial um, unit problem, which is this relationship between context and outcome. It may differ depending on the geographic scale or the zoning uh, area are chosen. So for instance, let's say that you're interested in the effects of green space on everyday mood. Um, but the question is, how should you define a neighborhood in this case for analysis? And that is, in is intricately tied to this idea of the modifiable area aerial audit problem, a unit problem, sorry. So do you use cens census tract to divide these places um, into neighborhoods? So for instance, do you use census tracts, these, um, or, po or postcodes, which, necess which don't necessarily map onto everyday experiences, but nonetheless, because there are census data, they allow you to also add on survey data that are readily accessible, or on the other, or on the other hand, do you want to define neighborhood by drawing on, for instance, local histories or how the individuals residing in this, these particular spaces would themselves define neighborhoods? And so findings regarding this are a little bit mixed, actually. So there are, there are a number of studies that show that actually the, how you define neighborhood um, actually doesn't seem to matter for the outcome. But on the other hand, you have perhaps one of the most widely cited study that I see relating to this problem, uh, which is by um, Openshaw and Taylor in 1979, which showed basically that depending on how you just sliced up counties, how, uh, sorry, how you sliced up neighbor uh, counties, yes, um, then the relationship between Republican voting and the the number of old people in that district um, could, the, the correlation between which could vary anywhere from negative 0.97 to positive 0.99. Um, so, so that's a big difference, right? It's, it's, possible, it's, it's opposite sides of the spectrum altogether. Um, so these are real problems that, that really ultimately boil to what it is that you're interested in and how, it, and how you should begin to conceptualize context. What really is context? What is the environment by which you will derive your exposure measures? Um, and the second problem is the uncertain geographic context problem, which actually taps into what I said uh, earlier in terms of really Oftentimes, even though we speak about context, we're actually not really cl that clear on what we mean by context. That is, how exactly is context affecting? What, what, how, are place, how do places exert effect? Um, and, and, we, and sometimes we don't often know what is operating, for instance, in that neighborhood that generates these outcomes that we're interested in. So, um, this, this is also tied intricately to the fact that we don't necessarily know where people are, how long they've been there. So for instance, we might know, for instance, that Bob resides on the street in Atlanta, but we don't necessarily know how long he's been there, and we don't know where he is. We might well not, well, maybe we do know where he is, but we don't know how long he's been there. We don't know where he goes about on his day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so for instance, 70, so actually adults, among adults, 70% of their time is spent in non-residential neighborhoods. So 
on a day-to-day -day basis, Bob, as he goes through work, as it's daily activities, for instance, might actually be traversing through a lot of places with a lot of with different um, green spaces. So taking it at the neighborhood level um, is not that easy. And then also, multi-level models are great when there is a clean nestedness. That is, when, for instance, families are nested in, you know, individuals are nested in families, families are nested in particular neighborhoods, na nest neighborhoods are nested in particular districts. But at the same time, the hierarchical linear modeling, multi-level modeling, isn't that useful when there isn't that clean nestedness, right? So for instance, on a, you, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you might go to work, which is outside of your neighborhood. You might go to shop in a particular space, which is outside of your neighborhood. And and, and also the same individuals, because they, they have different activity spaces within the same household, may have different exposures. Um, so this is one illustration of this uh, uncertain geographical problem that we have. And so this is some data that's, um, that deals with substance use behavior. So say what you're interested in at the moment, uh, what you're all interested in at the moment, is, is substance use behaviors. And you want to predict substance use behaviors by people's everyday exposures. In particular, you thought it would be great if you could think about exposure in terms of um, an index for community SES exposure. So this has so this is basically a drawing from census data where you're trying to create an index of, of things that has to do with community SES. So for instance, um, with median income, for instance, household income, or the number of, of um, households with, with parents, with, with uh, heads of households with um, college education, say. And then the second thing that you're interested in is violence. So on a day-to-day -day basis, as, these, as, in the, as your participants are going about their daily lives, um, what is the degree of their exposure to, say, low community SES to a lot of violence? Um, and how does this predict their substance use behaviors uh, on a daily basis? So say in the context of this study that you decide to recruit a number of individuals 47 of them, for the sake of illustration. Um, and, and, and these individuals, um, you give them a GPS logger. And so this GPS logger, they'll carry around with them for the duration of the study. And this, this GPS logger will log, um, for, log a, a coordinate for every 20 meter that a participant goes, or alternatively, every 15 minutes, whichever happens first. And, on, and you also give them a Palm Pilot, or you just have them install an app on their phone. And these individuals are going to answer questions three times a day at random points of the day that ask them about drug cravings, that ask them about substance use behaviors, that ask them about their moods, levels of stress, and so forth. And, and also, you're going to um, basically also ping people at, at you're, they're all, you're also wanting to make this event contingent. So you're going to have people report when they're using substances um, outside of the three random time points. So let's say that you track these individuals for an average of 107 days. So after about 107 days, you're going to have about 35 million um, GPS data points. So what do you do with the data points? How do you measure, like what here, how will you measure exposure, right? So you have this GPS, these 35 bil million GPS coordinates. Uh, that, that tell you the, tr the spaces that people traverse. So wh where, what is the context here by which you'll derive your exposure? That exposure being the community SES, you know, how much, for instance, during those 107 days they were exposed to what kind, of, what level of community SES to violence. Um, so there's, a, there's different ways of slicing this, right? One way, one way of doing it is that you could look at the GPS coordinates themselves. That is to say, you know, the, um, for instance, if you know, the, the first coordinate is in a space where community SES, say, is at, I don't know, five. And then on a, on a second GPS point where it's, it's at a 10, then you're going to average it. And so that's going to be 7.5. And that's going to be what you say is the exposure. The context here is going to be the GPS coordinate. And the exposure is 7.5 based on the context that you've, that you've um, arrived at or yeah. decided to use. Alternatively, you know, you could also um, say, for instance, you could imagine that maybe these GPS coordinates aren't that accurate. So for instance, in highly dense neighborhoods, in highly dense cities, um, uh, in ideal conditions, iPhones, um, G the GPS coordinates are about accurate to about nine meters or so. So you, you, you don't trust it that much. So you decide to create a buffer zone around each GPS point. So that's one way also of measuring context, and that could be the context. Alternatively, you could draw a polygon around that would encompass all of your GPS points. And this could be your context. And from there, you could measure exposure. Well, how you define that context has a lot of implications here, as you see. Mouse. <laughs>
here as you see, um, for the variation that you see in people's exposure, in this case, to community, uh, S, um, community SES. So imagine that this, the higher this is, the lower the community SES is. And the negative here is corresponding to higher community SES. And, and so these are different approaches that you could take of, of, uh, <clears throat> of well, I guess, putting context onto this GPS data. So one way, as I've mentioned, is to actually use the GPS coordinates themselves, uh, which is the blue line right here. But alternatively, HB right here is to use the inferred um, home. So basically, um, to use the inferred home address. And, and from there, to use that as context. And this will differ, so for instance, in this case, if you're using uh, people's home as context to determine their exposure to community SES, then you see a lot of variation among these 45 individuals that you're interested in. But alternatively, if you were to, use, if you were to draw just this polygon that, in, that encompasses all of the space, so this is the red line right here, you can see that there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of variation, actually. And so to put some numbers onto it, um, in terms of if you're doing inferred home location, that's the HB, this black or dark blue line here, then, this, then the standard deviation among your participants is about 6.5. Alternatively, if you're going to use inferred home address, and that's the red line right here, much flatter as you can see across participants, then the standard deviation is about 1.55. And the same could be said in terms of the impact of what you choose as context um, on, on, on but on crime exposure um, could also be illustrated here, where some approaches suggest actually there's not a lot of variation between individuals in terms of their exposure, whereas other approaches suggest that there's a ton of differences between individuals on their day-to-day -day exposure to crime. So this, this matters a lot in terms of, you know, for instance, the variation that you think of in ter that exists in exposure, and also a lot, in a lot of differences in terms of the conclusion that you arrive at, whether, for instance, location or, res or residence actually impacts health outcomes. Uh, actually, in the context of this case, uh, or, you know, so, so it might influence it, but it might not. But, but it's to suggest that, that these things matter, and it's a real problem to consider when you're thinking about what context is and how you should um, study context. Um, so so, the, so uh, this is unfortunately a slightly outdated meta-analysis um, that, that show, well so this is um, that showed the rise of um, of place effects publications and so you can see that there's there's been an increase of that and no doubt uh, still an increase uh, although 90 percent of which as I've mentioned really just focus on residential neighborhoods and and most of which focus on the effects of poverty and in living in impoverished neighborhoods in particular on health outcomes um, but nonetheless, these studies are increasing. So, so the, it does raise up the question of why now? Why be interested in place now? Why, not, why, why pick up this now? What's a, what, why, why bother, right? Um, well, so I think part of it has to do with this, this idea that locational precision is very strongly tied to statistical precision. And with the proliferation, as, as Mike mentioned, of smartphones, you have now the, gra the greater availability of low-cost GPS. That's, rel that's relatively accurate, as I've mentioned. Um, you know, maybe nine meters off or so. Um, but so for such spatial methods, what you require are locational data that's accompanied by some kind of attributes data. And now, smartphones are increasingly available. So in 2017, about 80% of Canadians own a smartphone, and about 70% uh, of Americans own a smartphone. And not only do they own a smartphone, they're, they're, they're very invested in their smartphone. They carry their smartphones around on a day-to-day -day basis. So for instance, um, approximately 82% of Americans report that they don't leave their home without carrying their smartphone with them. And not only do they carry their smartphone with them, they're actively engaged with their smartphone. So the average amount of time that people spend daily on their smartphone is about 2.7 hours. So this suggests an opportunity, and this suggests potentially the use of smartphones as a scientific instrument um, that could potentially also deliver interventions. Who really knows? I mean, I think we talked a little bit about some of the ethical um, issues regarding uh, technology, regarding, for instance, and, and no doubt also the, the avail um, about um, of, of smartphones in particular. But I think one thing to consider is, uh, for instance, for in low and middle income countries, for every 3,000, for every 5,300 individuals in low and middle income countries, there are approximately 2,300 2, smartphones, but only 11 hospital beds. So it does perhaps suggest the potential for digital health interventions, the, the, the potential for smartphones in, in, in perhaps negotiating with some of these um, uh, stark dynamics.
So um, now I'll, I'll transition a little bit to talk about the different types of geospatial data that are available. Uh, so one is more at the census and population level. So this is an example of AIDSView, and AIDSView is uh, an online interactive map that's made available by collaborators um, at Emory, so Patrick Sullivan and, and the PRISM initiative at Emory. Um, and it allows for users to explore the HIV epidemic in the US by state, by county, by zip code even. And uh, so why is this important? Or why why, why be interested in this? Um, well, so data from the CDC, for instance, show us that of, in 2014, that of those who are living with HIV, 86% know of their diagnosis. They know that they're positive, and 40% are engaged in care. So that is, you know, they, they've they've gone to at least two clinical visits, and 37% are currently using antiretroviral therapy, but only 30% are viral, vir, um, virally suppressed. And time to diagnosis can be estimated based on the degree uh, disease progression, the CD4 cell count, at the time of diagnosis. And as you can see on the top graph, there's actually a lot of racial disparities in terms of the time to diagnosis. So for instance, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians are much, are much more likely to be diagnosed later, as well as older uh, Americans. And they're also actually more likely to, um, uh, for instance, uh, Black and Hispanic, uh, men who have sex with men are more likely to be to have current STIs, and this will increase um, the risk of of, um, of sexual of HIV um, infection. So, but is but this isn't but that, but the these dynamics are not. Mm, evenly found within the United States. There are regional as well as state level differences. And AIDS view allows for us to be able to visualize some of this. So for instance, in this graph here, what you see is the percentage of males living with HIV that's attributable to male to male contact. Um, and the ones in dark are where male to male contact is, is the primary mode of transmission. Whereas for uh, in those in lighter counties, so li lighter shades of red, uh, other modes of transmission such as heterosexual transmission or injection drug use are more common. And this changes, for instance, when you consider male-to-male -male sexual contact alongside injection drug use. And there's also a means of visualizing the HIV care continuum, uh, which is also powered by AIDSview, that allows us to see this, these disparities that exist even within Atlanta in terms of um, HIV diagnosis, in terms of linkage to care, engagement in care. So what this shows right here, um, is, is engagement in care. So individuals that are going to clinics um, and, and after diagnosis. The areas that are darker suggest lower linkage to care, whereas those that are lighter suggest higher linkage to care. So perhaps to no one's surprise, um, in the city of Atlanta, for instance, linkage to care is much better than it is in, in, in rural areas that surround Atlanta. But, but, actually it's also, but actually, it's when these things don't quite match up that it's also interesting. So for instance, in Vietnam, where I work, there are multiple outpatient clinics where an MSM, where an individual diagnosed with HIV could go to get their HIV medi uh, ARV medication. However, preferentially, people go to OPC NTL, which, which might be in some cases. So currently, there are 199 MSM that are receiving treatment at this um, OPC. And the distance that they travel is, varies quite a bit. So you might be able to justify why it is that someone might go five to seven kilometers to this OPC as opposed to the OPC that's one, two um, kilometers from them. But, how, but what about individuals who are going 100 kilometers, 150 or 200 kilometers, which I, which I, actually, which I see? Um, so what's driving that? And so I think um, on the one hand, we could be thinking about this map as allowing us to see issues of accessibility and where it is that we need to leverage resources, where we need to leverage interventions. But accessibility can be conceptualized um, 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 in many different ways. On the one hand is accessibility in terms of whether it's actually physically there or not. Um, but there's also accessibility and, and whether it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's within physical traveling distance and also whether it has the, the services of interest. But there's also issues that of accessibility that relate to acceptability. That is, whether the services themselves are acceptable, whether they're, they're perceived to be friendly or not. And I think these, um, when there is this incongruity between access, uh, different forms of accessibility, it's when it's particularly interesting and in which GIS can help us uh, illuminate some of these dynamics and, and ask questions about why that might be.
another study that I think also operates at, an op at a population and census level that's also rather interesting in terms of its use of GIS related data uh, is and thinking about the relational aspects of space, of place, that is not just about the physical attributes of what's of you know resources that, that are there or not, but also about how people relate to one another and the historical contingency of space it has to do with this study that looks at cardiovascular disease in the United States. And this is out of uh, some of Mike, Michael Kramer's work in Atlanta. Um, and so, at Emory, sorry. Um, so in the United States, cardiovascular disease continues to be the primary cause of death. However, at the same time, there has been a de decrease in heart disease mortality by 62% within the United States. But this decrease in mortality is uh, unevenly distributed. So for instance, in certain southern counties, such as in Atlanta, for instance, for instance, as compared to somewhere more up north, such as in Boston, what you see is that in, in southern counties, the reduction is about 50%. Whereas in more northern areas, you see that the reduction in heart disease mortality could approach somewhere like 82%. And also on average, um, um, white, uh, white, uh, the decline for white Americans in terms of heart disease mortality is much steeper than it is for black Americans. And so why might that be? And so there's a lot of hypotheses that one could leverage. Um, but uh, what Michael Kramer did uh, was to look at the legacy of slavery, which I think is sort of interesting in terms of how he used um, GIS related census level data. So what he wanted to test was this hypothesis that it had to do with the country's differential history or engagement with slavery. And so the legacy of, of slavery differs in the, in the United States, as, as you know. So in some counties, a slave ownership might be 0%, whereas in others, it might appro approach 95%. On average, in the United States, it's at 29% or so. And so, in, so what, what, what is of interest is that perhaps these historic institutions, beliefs and practices emerging from differential slave ownership might influence previous or ongoing disparities in terms of um, location of resources, of technology, of information that might be driving uh, differential well-being and, and thus and contributing to material disposition or distress among this population. That's forestalling this decline in, in cardiovascular uh, disease mortality. So what they found is illustrated uh, in these two maps right here. So what you have is Morin's eye, and this is uh, this has to deal with spatial autocorrelation. And so you can interpret this in the same way that you can interpret, for instance, a correlation coefficient very roughly, which is that it ranges from negative seven, uh, negative one to one. And the idea being that you know the higher it is, or that the higher the absolute value is, the the, the more that things that are close together um, cluster together. So there's a there's a clustering of outcomes. So here, uh, this one has this this one looks at heart heart disease. Um, disease decline among black Americans and this one among white Americans. And you can see, and this right here has to do with the history um, of, slave, of, of, of slavery within the United States and slave ownership, whether that concentration of slaves approached, for instance, in, in lighter colors, just zero to 0.7.1%, or whether it exceeded, for instance, uh, approximated 50% in the, in the darkest shades right here. And you, and you could see, for instance, that these two maps look vaguely similar to each other. And indeed, that was what, um, what Michael found, um, which would suggest actually that slave ownership was positively associated with population size, land value, and man manufacturing output in 1960, higher black illiteracy in 1930, as well as black poverty in 1970, and concomitantly, it was also associated with a um, slower decline in, in um, in heart disease mortality among this population. And th I think that's, that's rather interesting because actually due to this ongoing flow of, of black Americans outside of the South, you can't actually say that it's, it's really, a, you can't um, say, say d definitively that that's because these, these, these individuals or children for, or, are descendants of individuals who are enslaved. And this is why we're seeing this outcome, that it has to do with some sort of intergenerational trauma. But perhaps it actually points to more of the long-standing effects of this historical period and how it's influenced um, some of the institutions or some of the practices, some of the regulations that operate at these county levels today. And what he actually shows is that um, uh, the, the sort of secondary outcomes such as black illiteracy and poverty actually in 1930 and 1970 actually explain 50% of the variation that you see in heart disease um, decline among this uh, population. So really interesting stuff and, and this is just goes to, um, uh, with what I've said in terms of um, black 
uh, in, in terms of slave concentration being negatively associated with heart disease decline among black Americans uh, within the United States. So, so let's say that after you know what I've what I've said, you become interested in in in, in GIS related stuff. So, how would you find this, these sorts of data? And so, I think there's there's many sources of finding um, readily available data sets, GIS data sets. There's the secondary data that that are readily available and that you can get online, as well as the administrative records, for instance, from a clinic or a hospital, as well as primary data that you can collect. And as you go down this list, um, the specificity of it, of the data to your research question increases, but also so too do the cost and the time that goes into it. Um, so. Uh, going from the going from the census level population level, um, now I'll talk a little bit more about neighborhoods and how people have um, sort of uh, worked with neighborhoods and neighborhood effects, and uh, you know how it is that one defines boundaries as experienced and perceived differentially by people. So on the one hand are the administrative uh, units, the census tracts, the postal codes, and divisions by counties for statistical reasons. So as I mentioned, this is useful because it allows you to draw from readily available census and survey tract data. However. Um, what you end up assuming is that people living in the same neighborhood have similar exposures, even though one person might have lived there for an X number of years, and one person might have recently moved there, or alternatively, you know, one person lies at the periphery of that neighborhood, whereas one person is at the center. But there is one neighborhood effect. Um, nonetheless, you know, this is where the majority of the research um, really is when we're talking about place effects. Um, alternatively, you could look at presumed activity space. So there's been some work, for instance, that tries to look at the, the that looks at the effects of um, of children's exposure to different uh, to children's exposure to. Um, disorder, physical and social disorder, on antisocial behavior. And in this case, to define the presumed activity space of the child, they use accelerometer data to, to show that actually on a, day, on a daily basis, children operate around 0.5, a 0.5 mile radius of their home. In which case, if you have that kind of data, then you could define that activity space as being this 0.5 mile radius um, uh, uh, around your participants' home. Alternatively, another approach is to look at perceived boundaries. And that is how the residents themselves um, perceive or experience these types of neighborhoods. So an example of which is Colton et al. in 2001. And what the, they basically had was to, to present individuals with maps um, of their of, uh, basically of their home at the very center and then eight miles uh, on all directions and then have individuals sort of shade in where they consider their, their neighborhood. And what you see is among individuals that are living in the same census tract, um, the same block, the same block, sorry, um, <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's about a shared shading of about 70% of the area. So there's about, so this brings up interesting questions as to the differences in terms of what's perceived as common and what's different and what that means about those particular spaces or how people experience them. And, and this is, I think, a really good example of neighborhood effects. And this actually comes out of Candace Audros's work and so actually um, uh, quite re closely relating to what, to what Mike was talking about. Um, so, so one of the most, as I've mentioned, investigated effects of place effects has to do with poverty and specifically living in impoverished neighborhoods and what do this does to uh, outcomes like risk-taking behavior, like antisocial behaviors. Because, for instance, uh, hypotheses, uh, sorry, theories such as broken window theory or opportunity theory would suggest that physical and social disorder would embolden individuals to, to uh, engage in these kinds of behaviors in contexts in which they're normative. Um, so, there, so policies encouraging, for instance, MEX neighborhoods draw, draw uh, from these types of hypotheses to suggest that perhaps proximity to high quality resources will benefit, for instance, disadvantaged children. But of course, the alternative hypothesis could also be true in terms of relative deprivation and relative SES, for instance, where daily reminders of one's, of one's lower social positioning might actually contribute to worse health outcomes. And so Audrey's, um, in, this, in this study, is trying to disentangle those two effects by investigating the influence of neighborhood SES, SES on users engagement in, in antisocial behavior. And this drew from a longitudinal study of, ch of, of children um, 
in the UK um, over a course of 12 years. And they measured um, antisocial behavior at age 5, 7, 10, and 12. And again, th um, this draws this in terms of how they define context. It was also, from what I mentioned, in terms of the accelerometer data, uh, which is showing that daily activities for children um, around 8 to 12 or so is, about, is within a 0.5 mile radius. And so this is how you get this um, uh, circle that surrounds the, the individuals, the participants' home. So the red dot is the person's home themselves. And then um, what Audrey's and colleagues did was essentially tried, was essentially to categorize based on census data, um, neighborhoods or these, these blocks into either those that were wealthy and well off, so characterized by, by high income and single family homes towards those that are more hard pressed. Um, so for instance, where um, the head of the household had no educational qualifications or alternatively was receiving government benefits aside from disability benefits where annual income for the household was less than 10,000, for example. And so you can see two examples here of two different participants. One is subject one, and so this is their home. And you can see that this is a hard pressed um, person, it's a hard pressed household, but, but they're surrounded by healthy achiever, wealthy achievers, or alternatively those who are at least comfortably well off or, or rel relatively well off. Whereas for instance, in subject two, you have this individual within, you know, that, that's being surrounded by other individuals that are hard pressed. So what does this do for antisocial behavior? And so this is um, what it suggests, uh, what the data suggests, which is uh, right here, for instance, when you're, uh, when you're a disadvantaged youth that are surrounded by uh, wealthy peers, and you see actually an increase in antisocial um, be, uh, antisocial behavior. But whereas if you are a hard, but those individuals who are themselves hard pressed, but surrounded by individuals who are pre hard pressed, then antisocial behavior is actually um, lowest. And this is actually the opposite effect is observed for their non-disadvantaged peers, where being surrounded by uh, hard pressed individuals actually increases antisocial behaviors. And I think, um, you know, many ways of thinking and about these findings, but uh, it certainly highlights, uh, for one, is the, this, the importance of sociality to place. Because on the one hand, there is the physical deprivation that has to do, for instance, of, of uh, being surrounded by, by less resources, um, by, for instance, houses of, of worse conditions, in, in worse conditions. But there's also the psychosocial dimension of poverty that derives from these interactions with peers that's, that surround oneself, and which imparts a more personal side to SES that might es escape statistical capture in this case. So I think this raises a fundamental question as to the processes through which people become emplaced, and the methods that are available to get us at the more proximal questions of how it is that places affect. Um, I think these are very pertinent questions because, as I've mentioned, um, one of the most investigated uh, phenomenon regarding place effects has to do with poverty. Um, so Dan Lende, for instance, has an article about this notion of uh, how poverty poisons the brain, and and, and takes a you know a critical stance on, on on that sort of literature. And so I think these are these are important points to raise. So as one might imagine, um, well. I'll skip over that for now. But, um, but, but what if the data are not available? So when we talked about, for instance, the population and census tract data, those data are readily available. In terms of looking at neighborhood effects, for instance, in Audrey's study, those data are also readily available. But what, how, but what about when, for instance, the data that you want to answer the questions that you want are not readily available? What do you do? Um, so in which case, well, you have to go out and collect it yourself. And so there, there are different approaches to this. One is a field audit. Uh, and field audits are basically rating this respondent-centered area. So you know where your participants are, and if you're interested in that activity space around them, that context around them, then you could go yourself and using a checklist of predetermined features, looking at social disorder, looking at physical disorder, social decay, social activities, begin to map out what exactly is the surrounding environment for your participants. And you would need, well, you know, a paper or a smartphone, some sort of GPS logger of some kind. And this often requires two or more people, um, so you can get at inter reliability, and then also um, to do multiple audits both during the day and during the night. So for instance, some things you'll only be able to observe during the nighttime, whereas others, you know, the same thing would hold during the day and the night, for instance, like such as the number of abandoned buildings versus something like social activities, like what are the adults in that particular space currently engaged in? This might well shift during, uh, the, depending on the hours of the day.
In terms of the tools, the questionnaires that are available, so these are just examples of which. One is the uh, is Nifty, for instance, and this is what what has been used in Bal the Baltimore um, study to look at uh, physical and social disorder and how that influences how stress influences uh, substance use behaviors. There's also the Active Neighborhood Checklist, which focuses more on activity levels and uh, the neighborhood av um, attributes inventory, as well as uh, other other inventories. Um, but uh, and in terms of the t tools that are available to facilitate this data collection, this, this audit of the field, if you will, um, there's a range of, of apps that you could use on your phone, for instance, so like the Open Data Kit, which is the most, I think, commonly used, or, or what is, I guess, the oldest one, the, the originator for everything else that follows it, uh, which is a free open source software that enables for survey development and survey data collection, both online and off. So that's particularly useful when you're working in resource-constrained settings in which internet um, might not be reliable. And there's a large community of users and developers. But unfortunately, there's a very little customization that would be available. And it also only works on Android. Um, you could also use the Kubu Toolbox, which also is derived from the ODK. And this is an online builder that allows for people to answer questions very easily um, on the phone and on the web. And what you have is an app that you could download. And it works on iPhone and Android. And it allows for data collection um, offline. So basically, people download the survey um, uh, when they're online, and then they complete those survey multiple times offline. And when that person has Wi-Fi access again, the surveys are finally pushed up into uh, the server. And so this is also a great option to use you know, when, for instance, your participants don't uh, use Android that, that, that much and, and prefer iPhones. And, and you also need the offline option. Compare is uh, by Demagi, which is uh, increasingly, I think, used in the context of digital health. And they're great in terms of, you know, it's, it's for it also some it's free, um, and there's and there but with paid options. So Demagi does a lot more customization options that are available for you, um, and allows for tracking. And what what is particularly interesting in this case that is perhaps not so much relevant towards doing field audits, but are more relevant towards using geographically explicit EMA, is that it allows you to track specific individuals over time in real time. So for instance, you can follow a case. For instance, how Bob feels on day one, day two, day three, uh, in. Real time and be able to see this on a very user-friendly interface. Unfortunately, it only works uh, on Android, but but also quite great. And then RedCap, um, which you know, I think if you collect health data, you're very familiar with. Um, you're more most like most people are more familiar familiar with the web option, but there's also actually an app option. Uh, to what degree that's actually a very stable app? Uh, that's that's a different question, I think. But but certainly it's available. Um, and then next is Biwi, and so um, some of my work in Vietnam uses uh, is using Biwi, and so this is more of a digital phenotyping app. So this is less about uh, field audits, but it's more about if you want to phen phenotype individuals. If you want to identify behavioral signatures and how it is that people are using their phone and being able to uh, see how that associates with a range of mental health outcomes, for instance, then, that, then BWE is more for you. It's more patient-centered. It's not really for field audits, but I thought I would just mention it if briefly. Um, so I would also, so I just wanted to provide just a very brief tutorial on what this would look like, uh, which may or may not be very useful. So let me know if you just want me to skip over it. Um, but Elmo is also one of these apps that, that could be used um, for field audits. And so it also is, is, is it's piloted, it's maintained by the Carter Center. And this is, um, that this, I've, um, this is a platform that I've worked with the Carter Center to adapt for use as a tool for field audits, as well as for participant-driven uh, EMA. And, but originally, Elmo slash Nemo was developed by the Carter Center for the sake of um, election monitoring as well as human rights violation. And it still maintains a lot of this in terms of how it works. So um, it builds off of the ODK, actually. If you, if you actually use the mobile version of this as opposed to the web or tablet version, then it, is, then it does run on ODK. And it simplifies the survey process and adds means of monitoring data in real time, which is great um, when you need to see these sorts of data in real time. And this is what the user interface, uh, this is sort of what the back end looks like. So this is particularly why I, I mentioned that it might be useful for field audits, because um, all of this is it's readily uh, visible to, to the researcher. And it also is geo-coordinated. And it also allows for you to easily add on um, researchers or participants who are helping with the field audit. So quite useful and convenient for those who find it so.
Um, and, and next is uh, the mobile app, which again, as I've mentioned, runs on ODK. And this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, one is that you have the administrator, you have questionnaires that you could build in. So these are quite forced choices that people make, or, and then also in terms of recording your GPS location. So this is where people just press record, and it records the latitude, the longitude of where this individual is, and it also gives you a sense of what the accuracy is. So as I've mentioned, in ideal conditions in urban cities, the accuracy is about within nine to 10 meters or so. Um, and this changes depending on where you are, and these are things that you need to consider um, when you're using these types of apps. Exactly how accurate are these low-cost GPS sensors that are readily available on smartphones? Uh, so this was, uh, so as I mentioned, field audits uh, in the context of how I've done them is that I've employed staff who are health educators who are uh, MSM uh, themselves uh, to, to engage in field audits. And cer but certainly you could also have participants engaged in field audits. Um, and this is one study, uh, the Community Alliance for Research Engagement, that, that, um, that has individuals living in those neighborhoods actually do more of the, the auditing work. And here just identifying food stores, restaurants, and the like. Uh, so in terms of Vietnam, so this is an example from, some, from Vietnam, as the title would suggest. Um, and, and so this is uh, looking more just, this was just when we were interested in doing a field audit of popular sites for sex work, in, male sex work in Vietnam. And so these are locations where we do outreach, actually, so daily outreach, where we go to these sites and, 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 and we're able to see and count, actually, the number of male sex workers that are there. And so that's the, the dots that are yellow or, or green versus the ones that are darker color. And, and then we were interested in doing a field audit around these, these sites of sex work. Um, so, th so what this looks like in effect is, well, one is that you would select um, some sort of field audit questionnaire. And so here I used um, the NIFTY questionnaire. And this is uh, a 169 item questionnaire that tries to get at physical and social disorder and so youth activity and adult activity uh, during the nighttime and daytime and also um, uh, indicators of alcohol and drug use. And so, this is, so the presentation yesterday, the very last presentation, said that the world is saturated with pilot studies. Um, and this is very true, especially, uh, and so too is the life of a graduate student. Because um, in the context of this presentation, I think um, what this example highlights is actually not only the application of field audits, but actually um, in some cases is where they're not really that useful or great because they're so expensive and, and actually very time consuming. So here in this case, when we were using NIFTY, um, we were trying to map out um, uh, the, the, part, this, the, the area that surrounded, for instance, a massage parlor where uh, sex was sold. And so in when you're doing these sorts of field audits, at least in this case, um, you know, you're walking here. So the first time we're going, so say imagine this to be the starting point. Uh, we're going up this way once, just walking normally to see what's the distance that we can cover in 10 minutes. And then we walk back to note the, lay the layout, the structure. So for instance, what are the types of residences that are available, the, the non-residential uh, buildings, the residential buildings, the business Businesses that are in that particular location. And then you're doing another walk for another 10 minutes where you're noting physical and social disorders, so broken windows, for instance, or the number of fights that you witness, um, the sort of activities that people seem to be engaged in. So what are the adults doing? What are the adults men doing? Are there adult men that are loitering around? How many adult men are lo loitering around? All kinds of, uh, of these sorts of questions. Um, and then you're do going back a second time to monitor, again, physical and social disorder because, again, there's, there are so many indicators that you really need to double check whether you're account is accurate. And then you're going a third time, this time, to note down the youth and, and adult activities. And these sorts of audits, well, you need to have two individuals that do them at the same time and independent of each other. And then you also are going to do it, well, not just once, but twice, right? And then also dur two during the night, two during the day to see what are the changes from day to day, from day to night. And in effect, this is sort of what it looks like when you're doing these sorts of field audits. So this is what it looks like uh, in, in Vietnam. And this is the old quarter area. And this is an example of the path that you would sort of take when you're doing a field audit around a massage parlor. Um, and actually, so this, this looks like a very small space that's been covered. Indeed, it is a very small space that has been covered. But it took us about four hours to do one of these. And so four hours uh, twice, and then twice day and night. So that's about 16 hours total for one location. And of course, this is only a very small segment of where individuals are going on their day, or are on their day-to-day -day life, right? So, so it's very 
difficult to actually measure, in this case, activity level, and so to have any concrete uh, or robust measure of, of exposure to physical and social disorder. And of course, we're not the only ones who, who have difficulties with this. So there's been more work that, that looks at field, that goes, that it goes beyond field audits to look at, well, can we use um, what's available to us virtually? Can we use Google Street View, for instance? And so this is a great, um, some great work by Candace Audris. Um, so she's also uh, has what she calls a neighborhood dashboard that actually aggregates, and is a tool that aggregates um, online uh, information related to neighborhoods. So it's not only just what's available on Google Street View, but also from the census and then also from patient, uh, from participant reports and from a range of other sources to be able to build the most, comp the most comprehensive possible uh, sense of, of what neighborhood exposures uh, mean. And, and so an uh, example of the application of these virtual audits uh, is, again, with the environmental risk longitudinal twin study in which 94% you, you know, um, of neighborhoods for participants in this study are viewable online. And so you can train raiders living or working in the UK to go around uh, virtually in participants' in where participants are and to be able to, again, using this, activ this activity space of a 0.5 mile radius, to be able to categorize or rate disorder, decay, danger, and street safety. So, you know, disorder, for instance, in terms of graffiti that's visible in terms of um, abandoned or, or burned out cars, decay in terms of physical decay. Again, this is very, these are very physical indicators. Um, dealing with street conditions, for instance, and deteriorated gardens and what have you. And then danger, just having to do with unsafe places to live street at night. So basically asking the raiders themselves to rate how, how safe they would feel walking down this area at night. Um, and then street quality. So again, these are very physical. These, these have to do with physical decay, physical disorder, because, you're using, you, because you can't monitor social activities when you're you know, doing a visual audit uh, virtually. Um, but what they found actually was that uh, these indicators um, <clears throat> of, that, that were assessed virtually mapped onto the census data. So this is the ACORN, so this is the census data, um, were significantly associated with census level data. And then it was also associated with local resident surveys. So local resident surveys are basically um, mailing surveys to residents that live around participants' neighborhoods, living alongside participants, and asking them to rate what is the neighborhood problems and neighborhood dangerousness. And it, and it seems that actually these virtual indicators are also mapping on to what, what, what residents uh, on a day-to-day -day basis are experiencing. So so I think that's, that's interesting on two fronts. One is it speaks definitely to perhaps the utility of these visual the online audits, but it also suggests that actually local perceptions perceive neighborhoods rather than you know, just being very abstract or, not, or, biased, or heavily biased, actually do seem to map onto some sort of physical um, concrete reality of some kind. And usually, and so in terms of inter-rater reliability, it was so so fifteen percent, fifty fifteen of the seventeen items ex, uh, exceeded seventy percent uh, inter-rater reli reliability. But the only two items in which this was not the case is sidewalk quality and also um, safety to walk at night. So more s subjective measures. And I think this is also true of other um, online visual audits that have been conducted in the past, which shows that actually these more subjective senses of safety and danger they don't they're, they're, they're the agreement around. Them is relatively low. So I think it really depends, again, on what it is that you're interested in. Um, but, but I think for the sake of this study, at least, um, it shows that actually these virtual audits, uh, these indicators that one arrives at using virtual audits, actually do map onto child uh, antisocial behavior, pro-social behavior, and BMI. So interesting stuff. Um, but there are limitations to using Google Street Views, which is that actually this works fine when Google Street View is readily available. So in the context of that study, 94% of participants' neighborhoods are readily available. But this isn't always the case. This, you know, Google Street View is not evenly available within a country, and it's certainly not available globally. So what you see on this top figure map right here is that uh, these areas that are, that are in dark blue are those where there's complete availability of Google Street Views. And light blue are those where there's partial availability. And green are those where popular tourist spots or destinations or main streets are available. Um, you, know, you have photospheres that are available. And then in gray are the, or white are the areas where none of this is available. So 
you know, this, so this, this works well when it works well. Um, and, and so I provide, so below is actually an example from Vietnam. So you see these dots right here. It's a little, the resolution isn't too great, unfortunately, but here's a dot, here's a dot, here's a dot, here's a dot. And these are photospheres that, where Google Street View, Street View is available. So you can see these major streets where it's available. You can also see right here this, this area surrounding the lake where it's totally not available. And this is Hanoi. This is a major city, the capital of Vietnam. When you get to a smaller urban city like Nha Yang, for instance, which is still in the north, which is still a major city in the north, you actually have only one photosphere for the entire city. And it overlooks this, this one shop, and that's it. And you have nothing else that's available. So you can't really do visual audits in this case. And I think, you know, I think there are interesting questions to be raised and should be raised regarding, regarding the politics of representation in terms of what's available and what isn't available, what's covered and what isn't covered. And so um, uh, one really good example of this is actually an article by Powerdoll in 2012, which look um, at the availability of Google Street View in an, in an estate in Ireland. And this is an estate that is characterized by 12 parks and over 1,000 1, households. And when Google Street View was just available in this area uh, in, in 2010, um, the, only, the only places from which it was available was always from other estates that, that overlook that, um, this particular area. And in the views were always of abandoned streets, of high walls that separated um, the estate from, from, from the surrounding areas because this estate was, was characterized by high crime and violence. And so it suggested a very particular view of this, of this, of this place. So um, in any case, uh, that, that's also one, I think, issue to consider. And the second issue to consider is the degree to which individuals ac are actually able to accurately identify their residential address uh, on Google Street View. So on average, among individuals that uh, have some familiarity with maps, it's about 0.65 miles. And this is a little bit worse in Vietnam, whereas people might be relying more on certain cues, like where the old cathedral might be, where Trang, Trang Thien Plaza might be. Um, and so in which case there is a larger margin for error. Um, so again, so what we've been talking about is census level and then neighborhood level data that you either have to collect yourself or that's available. But another thing to consider is activity space. So activity space has to do with the spaces that individuals cover on a day-to-day -day basis. And why this might be important is that, you know, for instance, Americans on average travel about 22, uh, 29 miles and also, you know, the, where people live don't necessarily coincide with where they are, where they play, where they work, where they go, and so forth. As I've mentioned, about 70% of times that adults, American adults, 70% uh, of the time in their day-to-day -day life, they're outside the residential neighborhoods. And this is uh, also uh, higher among, for instance, adolescents, where 50% of those who are 15 to 29 actually spend 92% of their times outside of the residential neighborhoods. Um, so, and for children ages two to, to eight, most of the time, uh, they're, they're spent in the school days, uh, sorry, in the weekdays uh, in, in schools, whereas during the weekdays, they're, they're, at, they're at entertainment or food places that are also outside of their neighborhoods. So when we're interested in activity space, what we get at is spatial polygamy, uh, which has a great definition by Matthew and Yang here. Uh, and spatial polygamy is this simultaneous belonging or exposure to multiple nested and non-nested social and geographic, real, virtual, and fictional, and past and present contexts. And the idea really is simply that people move and, expo and you know, exposure over, over a person's lifetime um, differs. And while neighborhoods have generally been the focus of substantial place-based effects, there's no correct scale at which to assess place effects. Um, and, and I think increasingly we're moving on beyond neighborhoods as being these discrete units towards seeing it as a more, as continuous data. Um, so a, a really good example, a really cool example of this is actually um, out of the Baltimore study that's looks at substance use, that looks at physical and social disorder and how it maps, or actually doesn't map, onto, uh, onto uh, drug cravings and drug use. So this is a study in which, in which you have participants who uh, rate on their smartphones on a day-to-day -day basis, three times a day, their moods, their levels of stress, um, their drug cravings, and these are individuals that are currently uh, receiving methadone um, treatment and and also you ask them about levels of stress and 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 the physical and social disorder is actually um, done through phys through 
uh, field audits. So this was an extensive three-year long um, audit of, of physical and social disorder in, neighbor, in neighborhoods in, in, in Baltimore. Um, and what there, what's interesting about this study is that it shows uh, that if you look here, drug, it, heroin craving as well as cocaine craving and negative and positive mood, what's interesting about this study is that, well, you know, according, based on theories like opportunity theory and window and open and broken windows theory, what you would imagine is that physical and social disorder um, would corrode neighborhood cohesion and exacerbate feelings of social isolation, fear of physical danger, and this cre would create perhaps higher negative affect, higher levels of stress, and these feelings of higher levels of stress and negative affect might potentially lead to higher drug cravings uh, for cocaine, for, 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 hero for heroin, for instance. But what they found, interestingly, was the opposite, which was that in, in areas characterized by the raiders, the field auditors, um, by higher physical and social disorder, um, people actually seemed to be happier in places where there were, there were greater disorder. And also their drug, their drug cravings were much lower. So uh, this, so interesting data here. So you can look at this right here. So right here, you see, for instance, this association between cocaine, cocaine tra craving and social disorder. And actually, as um, social disorder increases, it seems that cocaine cra craving actually decreases. And so too, as physical disorder increases, um, both cocaine craving and her heroin craving seems to go down. Uh, and the negative mood actually also seems to go down. So why might that be? And so I think um, shifting more now towards, uh, shifting now more towards um, these how we get at perceived aspects of space um, is, is one way of, of thinking about it. So um, this is an example I think that I tend to use quite a bit. Um, and this is a study looking at, it, in Jerusalem, looking at religious minorities and how religious minorities in Jerusalem relate to the city itself. And so th this is basically a map that's presented to participants, um, women um, in this study. And so they're asked to draw out places in which they felt at home or places where they felt comfortable or not, not completely comfortable, very uncomfortable or even fearful, or places in which they're not very familiar. And then, it, uh, and then you, know, you give these participants a GPS logger to go about their daily lives and to see, so these are the black lines right here to see the spaces in which they traverse. And what you see actually um, among minority groups, at least, the spaces that they have to traverse and the, the amount of time that they have to spend when they're working, going about grocery shopping or what have you, uh, in places where they feel not completely comfortable or very uncomfortable is much higher than for majority, um, the majority religious group. And so what this suggests is that the city may evoke a multitude of feelings for different individuals um, and constituting varied mental maps or everyday geographies that may or may not um, constrain what they actually do or how they feel or, you know, or engage in risk or how it influences risk-taking behaviors. So if the ratio of disorder to outcome is not one-to-one, -one, then how can we begin to dissect these sort of boundaries and segments, these flows of everyday life? And then these sorts of the narratives, the feelings, the, the stakes that are invested in, into space or places. Um, and you know, the, the cognitive approaches, especially out of, uh, in anthropology, as well as out of um, feminist geography are relatively common. Uh, well, not relatively, they are quite used quite a bit, more so than say in public health. Um, Example of which is here, friends, is provided here. And here uh, is a study in which you're asking youths in Los Angeles to map out spaces, again, in which they feel uh, comfortable, which is in, marked in green. So these spaces right here, right here, right here, right here. And then the ones where they feel uncomfortable or, or even scared, and which are marked in red, versus the ones where they feel relatively neutral about or they're not very familiar with at all. And that's marked in green right here. And in the context of this study, um, they were able to listen, they were, after the mapping, Activity, you were um, the the participants used Google Street View to be able to locate these spaces of, of belonging or unbelonging these these spa these nodes of safety or what have you, and, and and talk in a more focus group session about how how it is that why it is that they marked the spaces that they that they did, and I think this this enables us to better have a more enriched understanding of, of safety and danger signals, if you will. Um, so. So I think 
I, this is another example that has to do with crime mapping. So having individuals li living in these particular neighborhoods map out for themselves places that where they perceive there are to be problems in terms of crime level activities. And I mean, oftentimes, aside from the geospatial data that it provides, it also provides really rich qualitative approaches. And I'll be talking a little bit, uh, just very briefly and, and in very broad strokes, about some of the stuff that we're doing currently in Vietnam. Um, so some of my work in Vietnam, as I hinted to, is really look. It's focused on each HIV and specifically uh, on HIV and PTSD comorbidity. And what's interesting about that is that uh, in terms of HIV comorbidity, um, is comorbidity is actually higher among those who are HIV positive. Um, so it's higher than what you see among former war veterans, what you see among cancer survivors, and what you see among the general population. So uh, in the US, PTSD prevalence among those who are HIV positive is at 30%. Um, and this is, again, higher than what you see among the other groups. And so uh, this is remarkable. And the, while the neurobiology of PTSD in the context of HIV is relatively poorly understood, there's emerging understanding that would suggest that there's multiple points of interactions. And first, one of the hallmarks is intrusive, involuntary recollection of traumatic memories, often associated with hyperarousal and exaggerated fear response. And, several, and so this is what we're trying to get at here, to understand how it is that HIV modifies PTSD um, symptomology. So this is uh, data from Vietnam, preliminary data from Vietnam, comparing those who uh, controlling for trauma, what you see is that controlling for trauma exposure among those who are HIV positive compared to those who are HIV negative, um, avoidance symptoms are significantly higher, but you also see elevation, but non-significant, of a re-experiencing and hyperarousal symptoms among HIV positive uh, individuals. And then also in terms of the psychophys side of it, um, you know, several psychophys indicators have robustly predicted um, fear symptoms among trauma-exposed individuals, including heart rate, skin conductance, and heart rate variability, where you see, for instance, elevation of skin conductance and heart rate among those um, who are exposed to high levels of trauma, but also decrease um, heart rate variability and dysregulated startle response. And this pattern is actually it mirrors um, what you see in terms of autonomic activity for, um, for after HIV infection. And so we were, and so this is some of the psychophys data. So this is measuring, uh, this is very light and hard to see, but basically this is measuring skin conductance during baseline and then during a trauma uh, interview task. And this is looking at their skin conductance response. So you can see this right here is during baseline. They're at rest, relatively low. And when they're talking about their trauma response, it's, it's very high. And from some preliminary EM day data that we have, we also see that among the MSM in comparison to their heterosexual, heterosexual peers, you see um, in terms of their daily experiences when we're asking people about six to eight times a day for about a two-week period, um, they're, they're much more likely to report feelings of anger, sadness, or anxiety, and much more likely to report higher levels of stress. And so what we became really interested in is thinking about that cognitive map and this idea that perhaps disorder isn't map, physical and social disorder isn't mapping onto to um, Onto, uh, so onto perceived senses of safety and danger in a one-to-one -one way. So really thinking about how it is that we could use these cognitive maps and translate them uh, outside into the context of day-to-day -day life and actually integrate it with, with with geospatial data in more concrete ways. And one way that, that, we're, that we're doing so is to think about these zones as being zones of safety versus uh, danger, for instance. So for instance, um, you know, out of some of the work from the Grady Trauma Project would suggest that one of the most robust indicators um, of of P with respect to PTSD is the failure to inhibit psychophysiological arousal in the context of safety signals. So could we translate that into the context of day-to-day -day life where we're using these cognitive mapping activities to determine places of physical danger, places of safety, and then sending people out into the wild, so to speak, and having them people wear these bio patches. And so these are the patches that we use. Um, they're the bio stamps. And these, uh, the bio stamps monitor skin conductance, uh, sorry, not skin conductance, heart rate, heart rate variability, as well as respiration. And and uh, with the endpoint, the latest version of it, you're also able to monitor physical activity levels and, and sleep quality. And seeing how this becomes altered, for instance, when people are in zones of safety versus zones of, of danger and how, for instance, the response to self-reported stressors uh, varies. And so we also, so, so we recently adapted, uh, we recently uh, developed, adapted a, a BWI um, for Vietnam. And so this is, again, as I've mentioned, a digital phenotyping app. So we, we um, uh, a bioengineering student that was wor that was working with me helped set up this app, and, and what we're interested in is again de de determining these these behavioral signatures, um, for instance, that deal with phone usage, that deal with motor activity, um, and, and whether we're able to identify how that becomes modified in the context of, of 
of, of trauma or, or PTSD or in the context of HIV, for instance, and whether we're able to distinguish individuals controlling for trauma exposure, um, those individuals who are HIV positive versus those who are HIV negative based on their, their reactions to stress in a real-time setting. And so data collection for this is ongoing. So, um, so for, for the main study, we have about 122 indiv 120 individuals. We're trying to get to, I'm trying to get to 200 people. Um, so so not, not really presenting anything much there. And um, my, my laptop is dying, so I will go to the, to, the, to the last point, which is that geospatial mapping can be used to analyze both the qualitative and quantitative research questions about place that are exploratory, descriptive, explanatory, and predictive. They enable us to understand how it is that individuals become emplaced and sort of the processes at work by which places affect people and, 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 and bring up important questions regarding context and specifically what it is that we mean by context when we're trying to s translate these neuroscientific processes uh, in situ. Uh, or understand them in situ. Um, so with that, um, any comments or suggestions or co comments or questions? Well, thank you very much for that rapid fire and rich presentation. That was very fantastic. Um, one thing I was thinking about was, um, you know, I totally think your, your neighborhood critique, I think it's a good starting place if that's a real road of how people actually spend uh, their time. You've got all these really sophisticated techniques for more real-time spatial location, which is really good to see. Um, I was thinking, though, in the eight, it seems like your assumption is they're often not in their neighborhood. They're in some other physical place. And what I couldn't help thinking was, actually, in the age of the smartphone, we're often not in any physical place. Mm -hmm. um, and these, the smartphone technologies and some of these communications technologies have the ability to take us out of almost any of these spaces that you're talking about. So I was just thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if you could combine some of these techniques with some kind of internet browsing or activity or some kind of technology to see where people or spend, I mean, it could be a pornographic site, or it could be a game, or it could be Instagram, or someone in Vietnam could be reading media stories in the U.S., but that seems like that would be quite important, um, and some kind of metric of smartphone use combined to how people are using their smartphones as a kind of virtual place that might even further eliminate a lot of the noise that maybe you see in some of these associations between physical space locations. Them right, no, definitely. I think, you know, as I mentioned with the spatial polygamy, it was also really interested, this notion of spatial polygamy was also really interested in the virtual spaces that people occupied. But really, what are the sort of methods that would enable us to do so, I'm not too clear about. So I think, as you mentioned, um, you know, browsing history is very interesting. Uh, I'm not too aware of sort of studies that track browsing activities on laptops in real time, but certainly, for instance, in BWI, what it does, among other studies in the past, is uh, with ecological momentary assessments, is try to complement what you do ask with passive monitoring. Um, so things that are being observed in the background as participants are using their smartphones, for instance. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit about this before, but in terms of, for instance, what BWI monitors is, um, for instance, your call and text log. It doesn't necessarily monitor, like, for instance, you know, you calling Bob, you calling Anna or something, but it, you know, you contacting uh, person one, person two sort of thing, and then also the apps that you're using and the amount of times that you're spending on those apps. Yeah, that, that's giving, yeah, you're right. Right, of course, that's giving at some of the things I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so actually some of the BWI stuff, it's, I think, um, so they've done a, some work that looks at, for instance, in the context of bipolar disorder as well as in schizophrenia, whether you're able to, uh, to detect abnormal you know, sort of usage signatures in terms of smartphone signatures and be able to associate that, for instance, with relapse in schizophrenia. So what they found actually using BWI was that um, uh, in terms of people's uh, phone usage as well as their motor activity. So we're monitoring using these, again, just GPS stuff, uh, using BWI again, monitoring where people are going, that actually there are anomalies in people's uh, phone usage and, and, uh, and, um, and motor activities. Uh, there are 72 percent higher um, before a relapse period for people with schizophrenia. Um, so I think these are very interesting work. I think at the same time that you know the sample sizes are less than ideal. Oftentimes, I think as Mike mentioned, these are very intensive studies that that sometimes don't always manage to recruit the sample sizes that we want. Um, but but really good stuff that could be done with it.
Oh, um, no, uh, physical disorder. So neighbor, phys neighborhood physical disorder. Well, so, so it's very interesting because um, I think part of it is, uh, on the one hand, so basically um, what this, the crux of this study and what it shows is that you know, these, these are physical and social disorders that are rated by um, the researchers themselves. So they're going into these neighborhoods in, in Baltimore and rating every neighborhood that, put, that the participant could potentially traverse in and be able to rate them on, on uh, attributes of physical disorder, social disorder, like the number of broken windows, for instance, or for instance, um, you know, uh, the number of fights that you witness or cursing that you witness as you're doing these kinds of audits, and that's social disorder. And, and, and this, again, gets at nestedness of data, right? And what you would hypothesize is that with greater physical and social disorder, you would see an increase in heroin craving or cocaine craving or negative mood or levels of stress, at least. But they see the opposite, which is in physical places that are, that are more disordered, you actually get lower um, heroin and, and negative mood and stress. And I mean, there's, there's many ways of interpreting this. One is that potentially that the participants themselves aren't quite attuning to the same indicators that the researchers themselves are. And another way of thinking about it, too, is that actually perhaps it, it disregards context. Perhaps what's more important is that, you know, for instance, when individuals are highly stressed, they might be more engaged in heroin, they might have higher heroin craving or, or cocaine craving, irrespective of the environment that surrounds them, the physical environment that surrounds them. So I think that these are multiple ways of parsing through the data. And um, I think, so actually, Oh, the researchers themselves. So I've, I've spoken to Kenzie Preston about this, and the and the GIS person that works with her on this. And they're also, you know, I think in some ways um, equally puzzled by 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 some of their so what they're finding here. And they're really interested, I think, in getting more at what I talked about in terms of the quality, the cognitive maps, in terms of getting more at um, the qualitative understand these quali more qualitative understandings of space and what exactly people are attuning to um, for these individuals. Um, you know, who are using heroin and cocaine are attuning to in their physical environment.